All right. Hi, everyone. Okay, I'll start off by giving a disclaimer that this is, uh, while this is the Lake Huron session, thank you for having me. This talk is going to be about all the Great Lakes. Um, and secondly, I wanna acknowledge that this is a project focused on uh, trying to understand Lake Whitefish and Cisco recruitment dynamics across the Great Lakes at scales spanning local to basin wide. And I believe that with a cross-basin analysis of this type, it requires a cross-basin team. So I wanna thank all of the partners that I've listed here from many different agencies across the Great Lakes and universities, of course. I also want to acknowledge that the, this is an ongoing project funded by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. This is also a project that relies on many decades of long-term survey data, um, data collect, people who have collected these data, maintained these data, and many individuals who were gracious enough to share data for use in this project. <coughs> I'm going to keep the background short on this. I, we've already talked about Cisco and Lake Whitefish a lot today, um, but these are our two species. I'll just briefly say that they're closely related, um, ecologically, economically, and culturally important fish species across the Great Lakes. And of course, we have um, today, Lake Whitefish support many important commercial fisheries across the Great Lakes. Uh, Cisco fisheries are largest in Lake Superior, but they are represented in uh, fisheries um, in the other lakes except for Lake Erie. Um, but in many lakes and in many regions within lakes, we have um, many programs ongoing for restoration of Cisco species. And um, across the lakes, fishery management objectives often involve things like maintaining or increasing uh, commercial fisheries for both of these species along with uh, maintaining, increasing, or restoring spawning populations across the Great Lakes. And the reason why I'm talking about both of these species today is that um, they, because of their shared uh, evolutionary history, they have uh, these interesting parts of their life history that we can use to try and better understand what's going on with each species individually. So Lake Whitefish and Cisco share generally similar early life histories. Um, different, they, this is going to be a generalization because as we know, these fish do different things according to different lakes that have different habitats. But adults of both species generally spawn in near shore spawning areas where their uh, eggs incubate over winter and hatch as planktonic larvae in early spring. Their life histories diverge sharply as juveniles, where Lake Whitefish transitioned to benthic habitats and Cisco remained pelagic. And so when we're thinking about recruitment and recruitment bottlenecks, we often think about those happening during early life stages. And because there are so many similarities between these two species earlier in life, we can make predictions about processes that are happening during those life stages as being more similar than different between species versus processes acting later, leading to potentially different recruitment trends. And maybe jumping the gun a little bit here, again, I'm not gonna belabor the point. There's a lot of concern about recruitment of these two species across the Great Lakes in both Lake Huron and elsewhere. Um, issues with declining or generally just infrequent or sporadic recruitment. Um, we have concerns about Lake Whitefish recruitment declining. Um, we want to increase many of our Cisco populations that are depressed in abundance. And one of the big unknowns is why we're seeing some of these patterns, why we have um, some Lake Whitefish populations declining while others are um, stable or increasing, why we have some Cisco populations that are increasing, even in the same areas where Lake Whitefish are currently declining. And the motivation of, of a lot of this work is taking a cross-lake, cross-species approach to trying to better understand what's driving recruitment variability. And the first step to that is having these comparable recruitment indices that will allow us to make comparisons across space and time and species. In other words, the ability to make apples to apples comparisons. And we have a few different reasons why we think this could be informative. I'll, I'll go through the list here. Each of the Great Lakes, um, while they have many similarities, they do have differences in their food web structure, in their habitat, um, in their degree of anthropogenic 
um, disturbance. And so while these fish are distributed across each of the Great Lakes, we have reason to believe that the important recruitment bottlenecks that each uh, population is facing, the relative importance of those might be, might be different in a way that matters. <clears throat> and to take that one step further, um, comparisons across lakes can also help us to understand to what degree uh, local scale factors or lake specific factors, uh, how those are important versus these factors that operate more at regional or basin wide scales, like these climatic factors, including having comparisons with inland lakes not connected to the Great Lakes, um, specifically Lake Simcoe, as Aaron introduced earlier. And lastly, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, Comparing across species can allow us to better understand um, at what points in their, their life history we're starting to see some of these uh, differences emerge in, in these recruitment trajectories. So this is um, the first key objective of the research study that I'll be talking about for the, the progress to date on this multi-year study, I'll say. So, you know, this first big question, what are the long-term patterns of recruitment variability for Lake Whitefish and Cisco in each of the Great Lakes and Lake Simcoe? And then using that information um, for today, I'll talk about some of the, the first work we've been doing to try and understand cross-lake synchrony in year class strength and recruitment, trying to understand how these populations spanning different lakes are moving in similar or different directions through space and time. So I'll be talking about spatial synchrony today um, and also temporal synchrony, trying to look at trends through time and whether or not those are similar or different among lakes and species. So this is the pipeline for this study. I'm gonna hit this at a very high level in all parts. I'm happy to, to talk specifics at, at a later time. But you know, this is our pipeline, uh, collecting data, harmonizing that data, we're indexing recruitment using year class strength estimation, and then using those estimates, like I said earlier, using correlation analysis to look at spatial synchrony and using dynamic factor analysis to look at temporal synchrony. So we searched high and low for long-term fish survey data sets that could reliably inform the year class strength of Cisco or Lake Whitefish through time. So looking for long-term time series of catch and age data with reliable detections and methods through time. I'll skip to the, the punchline here. Uh, we ended up with 38 uh, surveys in our final data set. Um, I also wanna make sure to thank, uh, this was a longer list originally, so uh, there were many people who shared data that didn't make the final cut, but I would still really appreciate that. Um, most, about uh, two-thirds, are fishery independent surveys, and the rest are fishery dependent. The combined time series spans a sampling period of 1960 to 2019, um, and we had a mean survey duration of about 24 years, which we were really happy with for trying to look at um, multiple, you know, long-term trends in Cisco and Lake Whitefish recruitment. Uh, this ended up being over a million unique records of age and other biological data, about two thirds of which describes Lake Whitefish and the rest, about a third, describing Cisco, which is a more data limited species. And uh, these surveys used a diversity of, of methods and gears, but we did our best to standardize those for metrics of effort, which were primarily things like gill nets and trap nets. Just to give you a little bit of a, a look at what those data look like spatially, so this is um, the survey data superimposed on a map for each species, like whitefish on your left, Cisco on the right. And this is just to say that we were really happy with you know, the data coverage that we were able to get um, for each species in each lake. And here's my cue to point out that Cisco are currently extirpated from Lake Erie. So I won't be talking about Cisco there, but we have data for, for each other lake and combination of species there. So how are we actually estimating recruitment using these data? So we're using your class strength estimates. So what I mean by that specifically is the relative abundance of each year class 
based on repeated measures through time across multiple ages and sampling years. So importantly, this isn't based on um, a recruitment index that's based on a single year. This is trying to make sure we're using multiple observations through time to get really robust estimates of the relative abundance of cohorts coming into the system. We're using a method that has been previously applied to look at recruitment of walleye and lake trout. Um, specifically, again, using longitudinal mixed effect regressions of relative abundance um, through time at the ages at which they're first fully vulnerable to the gear type relative to each survey. Um, and we're using this method because it allows us to account for the effects of different surveys as we're trying to integrate all of these different information uh, sources to get the most holistic view of, of recruitment in these systems. Um, and that includes things like different gear um, and various changes through time. And importantly, this is also a flexible framework for integrating things like fishery independent and dependent data sources in the same model. Um, it allows us to make standardized comparisons across multiple lakes and species. Um, again, the apples to apples comparisons, even in lakes where we have very different population sizes, e either within or between species. So I'll, before I start showing you a bunch of data for this, I just wanna orient everyone to what the plots are gonna look like. So all of these are estimated at a lake-wide scale at this point, pooling all of the available data for each lake. And so on the x-axis, we will have cohort. So that's time, that's the year in which the fish were hatched. The y-axis is our relative year class strength index. Those are in units of standard deviations from the mean relative to each model. And so this uh, dashed line here at zero is going to be the long-term mean relative to each model where anything above that will have been above average year class strength and anything below will be below average year class strength. And so we're gonna zoom out. We'll have 12 different panels with 11 separately estimated models for each combination of lake and species here. Um, I know this might be a little hard to see and I apologize. But here's what those data look like. Um, I'm gonna walk through some key take homes but I know there's a lot to digest here. So, big take home one. We successfully estimated year class strength for cohorts spanning 1956 to 2015 across the Great Lakes and Lake Simcoe, which we were, of course, thrilled about. And we think this is, these patterns are gonna be a really powerful tool for continuing to understand, increase our understanding of recruitment dynamics in these systems. And I'll walk through some, some key things to point out here. One, I'll point out that here, I've just zoomed in to Lake Huron here to say that for the most part, we don't see that Lake Whitefish and Cisco year class strength is moving in the same direction year to year in any lake. So again, I've looked at, I've zoomed in on this for Lake Huron. I'll back up a bit so you can sort of see what's going on here. But um, when you look within a given lake, uh, Lake Whitefish and Cisco year class strength estimates are not correlated with one another in either direction. And one of the interesting things that pops out here as well is that we see different patterns of recruitment variability between the two species. We see, for example, Cisco year class strength is very highly variable around that long-term mean. And we see that across all of the lakes versus Lake Whitefish, you often see there will be periods of a decade or more where recruitment is consistently above average or below average. So now starting to look at some of those follow-up questions using some of these, uh, using these data sets to ask questions about how your class strength is correlated through space and time. And so I just overlaid those estimates by lake here. Uh, I'm gonna run some statistics and show those to you because this is a little hard to see with all these data, but again, looking at spatial and temporal synchrony. The first thing we did was look at that spatial synchrony. And so this is looking at both pairwise comparisons across all combinations of lakes uh, for each species. 
and also looking at the average altogether. And on average, Lake Whitefish year class strength was significantly positively synchronized among lakes. Not all pairs were correlated, um, but on average, they were. And uh, for Huron specifically, I note that uh, it was Huron Lake Whitefish year class strength was significantly correlated with Lake Michigan, probably no surprise there, Lake Ontario, and Lake Simcoe. And when we, I skipped a slide, and when we look at Cisco, we see a different story. We see that Cisco year class strength on average was not uh, synchronized among lakes. And in fact, we have no significant pairs of correlated uh, lakes here. <clears throat> here I'm showing you the output of the dynamic factor analysis models. These are autoregressive state space models that look uh, for trends through time. Time series necessarily have noise to them, so trying to smooth out some of those variability and look at what those trends are through time in a way that also allows us to look at how those trends are, are common versus different among lakes. And what we see is Lake Whitefish year class strength was above average in all six lakes during the 80s and 90s. And we see that that's where a lot of that, that synchrony, the spatial synchrony is coming from in these time series. Whereas year class strength trajectories after about 1995 diverge in a few different directions. <clears throat> and again, we see a different story when we look at Cisco. While we were able to detect recent increases in uh, lakes Michigan and Simcoe in recent years, um, and slightly in, in Huron from a, a recent dip, a lot of that variability gets pulled to zero, which you can sort of see in, in by zero, I mean the long-term mean, right? There's no trend through time. So you can sort of see this for Superior, where it goes up, down, up, down. Ontario, up, down, up, down. Where it evens out to the long-term mean through time. So I'll just briefly summarize some key take-homes and, of course, some new questions that we have. These are um, preliminary uh, sort of thoughts at this time as to what might be driving these patterns. But, you know, one, we were successfully able to estimate year class strength for over half a century of, of recruitment variability for these species, which is going to be a really powerful tool moving forward, we think. We want to better understand why Lake Whitefish year class strength was positively synchronized among all six lakes in the 80s and 90s, um, and especially thinking about the variable trajectories thereafter. Um, there was a, a lot of scholarship during, um, before my time, uh, for the 80s and 90s period. And so I'm really interested in what's driving some of those trajectories thereafter and why some are moving in the same direction and why some are, are not. We're scratching our head a little bit about what's going on with, with Cisco here. Um, we have seen that that highly sporadic recruitment has occurred in, in Lake Superior, and here we demonstrate that for the other lakes. But we have questions about what might be driving the lack of synchrony in Cisco. And so maybe what's, what's happening here is that lake-specific factors could be more important, including the characteristics of individual populations. And lastly, we saw those uh, what seem to be very different recruitment dynamics between Lake Whitefish and Cisco, where Lake Whitefish is more of the, you know, roughly decadal or, you know, many years of above or below average year class strength, whereas Cisco is much more variable and trying to understand what might be driving those. These are very open questions that we're, we're hoping to address in the next phase of this project. But just to sort of give you a hint on the next steps, um, we really want to understand what's driving these patterns. I've shown you a lot of patterns, right? Um, the next step is to try and understand what those drivers are, whether those are demographic, uh, food web related, um, climatic, you name it. And we also know that different regions of the lake are operating differently. And so we want to understand um, and, and break these lake-wide estimates down into different regions of the lake and try and understand what's happening there. And ultimately, the, the goal of this project is to, to quantify synchrony and drivers of recruitment variability 
uh, up from local scales to basin wide. And if there's time, I'll take questions.